yeah, I just made you one point. I think Angus, I've picked all my boxes. So. <laughs> okay. the, um, just uh, one point around communication, good communication, which is for me personally also an issue because English is my second language. And I would recommend, and that's just my brief message, is that you do thoroughly uh, check uh, the language of your paper before you submit it. Because even if you've got a good message, you've got good research, but it's poorly communicated, um, you're going to struggle to get it published, and we're probably going to send it back anyway for you to do it. So, um, and we're getting more and more papers from uh, authors who do have English as a second or even third language. So that's just my uh, my my brief uh, comment. And then maybe just to link on to what Angus said around context, we do do a lot of case study research in um, in impact assessment, and we do write context specifically. But I think that links on to what Angus just said, is that the trick is how do you um, write within a context or do your research within a context, but then you're able to actually um, distill what the international message is from your particular context. Um, and how do you deal with generalization from case study research and so forth. So there's a, there's a challenge there for you writing. How do you actually, how do you do that? Okay, so Frank? So Angus and Francois are the co-editors of the journal. My role on this panel is to talk about the comments from the perspective of a reviewer. It's a bit hard to do that in response to a general question like this. So when, when the uh, questions start coming, I'll uh, comment how a reviewer uh, reacts to papers. And I do a lot of uh, reviewing for this journal. But just to kick off a few introductory comments from the perspective of my advice as a person who contributes lots of papers, the first one is, in fact I'm surprised Angus didn't mention it, but each journal has rules for submission and rules about style and rules about how you should organise things. If you want to get published, read the rules and follow them carefully. <laughs> right? Nothing annoys editors or reviewers more than somebody clearly hasn't followed the rules about you know, how to lay out the document, how to reference properly and that sort of thing. The second thing is reference properly. <laughs> and if you don't know what that means, Ask somebody who can tell you or look for guides on how to reference properly. But you know, journals must maintain good standards in referencing, and it's important that you follow proper procedure in relation to how to cite the people, people whose work that you're using. The next thing is you have to remember that you're telling a story for someone to read. And that means that when you write an article, although you're writing it from your perspective, You've got to keep thinking about how is somebody going to read it. So write it with the reader in mind. And what that means is that it's often a really good idea to write your paper and then wait a couple of weeks before you send it off so that you can read it again afresh. If you send it off immediately after you finished writing it, then quite likely it isn't good and you know quite right. So write it, put it aside for a little while, and then read it again before you send it off. Getting the language right is really important, and if your language skills aren't quite good enough to get it right, find a help to do that. In fact, even to get the story right, even when we're good at English as my first language, even when we are good at the language, getting somebody to read it to give you advice on how does it read as a reader reads it, rather than a writer writing it, is important. So having someone else read it first is a good idea. And always ask yourself, are you being clear about what you're trying to say? So just as we've already heard, it's very important to the reviewer, to the editors, but to the reviewers, is it clear what, this, what the purpose of the paper is? In fact, having a sentence that says, the purpose of this paper is to, is a really good idea. It really helps a reviewer get into, to connect. So um, that, that's a, you know, we actually almost look for it. Ross Milton. We almost look for the statement in the first two paragraphs that says the purpose of this paper is to. And then first as sentence. First <laughs> sentence. No, not necessarily. <laughs> and then the last thing I would say is make sure that you've cited the appropriate literature. The uh, reviewers are chosen to be reviewers because they're knowledgeable in their field. And if you haven't referenced the people that they would regard as being the appropriate people that you should have referenced, for the topic that you're on, it, they will just say, you haven't connected with the appropriate literature. It, you know, as
as a proper journal, it's important that you connect with other things that have been already done. So it, it, it is necessary that you do that. There's also this classic um, quote from our publisher, once to an author, which goes something around, uh, I, can, I can understand that you've, read the uh, that you've written the paper, but have you read it? Okay, so I think that is <laughs> the sort of question that you want to avoid as an author. Thank you, uh, Frank, uh, Francois, and Angus. Now, it's your turn. If you have any questions, do you think an editor or a senior scholar who reviews a bunch of things, or even a flunky who's chairing this session, pose the questions and we'll get the advice on the things that are important to you as a point of discussion? And your name first. Start up with. They did, so you're okay. <laughs> Uh, my name is Amal uh, Abidana. This is the housekeeping question that you, uh, what you, are, what you raised at the beginning. Uh, you mentioned that uh, blind, press, blind, uh, blind review of the article. So after receiving the comments from the, your reviewers, do you send all three of them to the author or just one? Or you compose all the, oh, okay. uh, the different reviews into one? That's one of the first question. Can I shoot my yes, 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 an answer and I'll come right back to you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Russ. Bill. Um, okay, we get the reviews back from our reviewers and we have two or three reviewers normally. We, uh, we don't, sometimes we only go to a third where we feel it's uh, necessary or we go to a third where the subject matter is something that Francois and I are not so familiar with. We've had a couple of those recently. <laughs> had some economic ones and some uh, nuclear ones that we were thinking, ooh, <laughs> we're a bit out of our depth here. So, uh, so th what we're looking for is where the reviewers uh, agree, then that's fine. Uh, if, if we have two reviewers and they are of very different perspectives, then we go to a third reviewer. We also have our own perspective. What we do in practice is sometimes the review comes back as uh, track changes. People have actually uh, written notes into the Word document or, or similar and actually marked up the copy. Often those people also send in a separate report. So we've actually got two files that they've submitted to us. Sometimes they just submit us a report. Sometimes they just send us an email. <laughs> Dear Angus and Francois, here are my comments on the paper. In which case we copy and paste them into a Word document. We normally send them as separate documents and we add in the email text that we send with, with those documents as attachments, we add our own editorial comments. Uh, in other words, our decision. Um, so, so you end up getting, sometimes you can get up to five or six documents. <laughs> it's rare, but it can happen. It's not uncommon to get two or three, and plus the email from us as editors. Occasionally reviewers will give confidential comments to editors. And sometimes, I mean, part of your question might be, why don't you always get two or three uh, comments back, right? But occasionally, reviewers will write confidential comments to the editors. And they do that for a number of reasons. Sometimes they might say they've got a conflict of interest and they can't do it. Other times they'll say, look, I'm, I'm not really expert in this field, but I'm giving you some general comments uh, about how I read it as a reader, but uh, you should know that I'm a little bit uncomfortable about certain some things. And sometimes they'll say, look, this paper's really, really bad, and there are lots of things I've got to say about it, but I can't, but I can't really do it in a way that my comment should go back to the re reviewer, sorry, to the author. So that's why editors will sometimes get more comments that they might actually uh, hand on back to authors. For me as a reviewer, I always like to be open and transparent, and it's hardly ever that I give confidential comments, but other reviewers tend to do that more often. For me, I see the process of reviewing as helping the author tell a better story. Right? That when you, some journals, especially when they get lots and lots of papers, they will, review them, they will regard the reviewing process as a knockout approach. Other journals, and particularly this applies to IAPA, we want 
mind you, we do reject journals, uh, articles. But we have a developmental mission and we want to make sure that all the members have a reasonable chance of getting published and that all the stories from all around the world, if they're good enough, will get there. So the role of us as reviewers is to help you tell your story in a way that you get published. Which means that when you get comments back from reviewers, you should take them seriously and really respond positively to them. But reviewers are very busy people and um, some, while they try to be helpful and use a helpful tone, because they're busy sometimes they are a little bit short in the way they make their comments. So try not to be annoyed with reviewers, even though sometimes when you get the rejection letter or the, it's, it, it could be acceptable if you did lots and lots of things. Um, as an author, and I get these uh, letters too, I get rejected quite a bit actually. The more you publish, the more you get rejected. Yeah. <laughs> right? So I know what it's like. But would it mean just uh, have faith in yourself when you get the letter that is either a rejection or much more work required, put it aside for a little while, a day or two, and when you're feeling positive and strong, then look at it again and say, okay, they're trying to give me advice here, and even though they could have maybe used a few more nice words, they are actually helping me, and if I follow what they say, my probability of getting published is, is increased. I, I'm going to cheat and actually respond substantively to, to further the point that Frank was just making. I submitted a, a, an article to a journal many years ago now, and I got back a response saying the first half of it is okay, you need to do this and this, but the second half should be deleted. And for me, the second half was the important part. <laughs> so I wrote back to the editors and said, if you will not accept a paper with the second half, I will not revise it. But if you will consider it, not accept it, that would be unreasonable. If you'll consider it, I will make revisions. And I made the revisions, and it was accepted and published as the lead article in the journal. So, but I, I did respond thought carefully and thoughtfully after a bunch of time to the comments that were made. And I even improved the second half to make it uh, more clear. Uh, Angus has one more, and then I'll get right back to you. 